Deep in the mountains of India lives the Aghori tribe. You might think these are people who like to live on their own just because they don't like other people. But when you get closer, it's clear there's more to it. Terrifying rituals caught on camera in the remote village prove that this is a place you'd never want to find yourself in. If you do, you might never be seen again. 1. The Terrifying Aghori Tribe The Aghori sect of Hindu ascetics stands out as one of the most mysterious and controversial groups in India. They live on the fringes of societal norms, especially around Varanasi, a sacred city by the Ganges River. Their beliefs and practices focus on death, destruction, and transcendence, making them both interesting and very scary at the same time. The Aghori see themselves as followers of Lord Shiva, the god linked to destruction and regeneration. They believe that achieving true enlightenment requires transcending societal taboos about death, impurity, and morality. To do this, they engage in rituals that most people would find repulsive, like meditating on corpses and consuming what you can only call unclean substances. Agoras often meditate in graveyards, surrounded by corpses, sometimes even sitting right on top of them. This practice symbolizes their acceptance of death and their desire to free themselves from the fear that society associates with it. They also use skulls as bowls and drink from them, sometimes consuming food offered to the dead. This act challenges conventional ideas of cleanliness and purity. There's also news that Agoris may eat small amounts of human flesh. They believe that such acts give them spiritual power and strengthen their connection to life and death. They cover themselves with ashes from cremated bodies, symbolizing their detachment from worldly concerns and their oneness with the universe. In a way, they think of their physical form as nothing important to the world. It's their spirit that really matters. Despite their public rituals, the Aghori remain secretive about many aspects of their beliefs. They distance themselves from mainstream Hinduism and often don't welcome outsiders. Those who try to document or question their practices have reported feeling unwelcome or threatened. Even if you try to talk to them, chances are they're not going to want to respond. Most of the things we know about them are the things researchers have learned over decades, not because they were open about it all. The Aghori challenge common views of morality, purity, and spirituality. Their practices force people to confront their fears and biases about death and the afterlife. They believe that true power and understanding come from embracing what society considers forbidden or unclean. To them, there's nothing like it. Flesh, ashes, and even human waste. Nothing is off limits to them. But they're not the only ones like it. There are others, and some of them are far scarier than others. For more terrifying, creepy rituals like this, make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We've got a lot more where this came from. 2. Like the Yaifo tribe. The Yaifo tribe, an isolated indigenous group, lives deep within the dense jungles of Papua New Guinea, located in one of the most remote and dangerous regions of the world. Reaching the Yaifo can take over a month, with the journey fraught with treacherous, crocodile-infested waters and dense rainforest. This isolation has kept the tribe largely untouched by modern civilization, allowing them to preserve their ancient traditions and way of life. While much about the Yaifo is still a mystery to the modern world, the tribe has become known in recent times for its warrior culture, survival skills, and fierce defense of its territory. One of the most famous aspects of the Yaifo tribe is their connection to headhunting, a practice that was once common among certain tribes in Papua New Guinea. The Yaifo, like their neighboring Asmat tribe, are said to engage in the brutal tradition of headhunting. In this ritual, they collect the skulls of their enemies, which they display as trophies within their villages. 
These skulls serve as both symbols of power and warnings to outsiders that trespassing on their land could have fatal consequences. The presence of these skulls in Yaifo territory has historically kept many intruders at bay, as few are willing to risk the consequences of venturing into their remote jungle world. The Yaifo are known for their agility and ability to navigate the dense, challenging terrain of their jungle environment, something not everyone is able to do. The men of the tribe, in particular, are known for their supernatural-like speed and agility. Reports suggest they can move between treetops with ease, vanishing into the jungle canopy without leaving a trace. This unique ability to move swiftly and silently gives the Yaefo a significant advantage in tracking prey or monitoring potential intruders. Outsiders have often reported that by the time they notice the Yaefo, it's already too late. The tribe has been watching them long before they became aware of their presence. But unlike most isolated villages, it's not just the men who are important here. Women in the Yaefo tribe also play a crucial role in the tribe's defense and survival. Yaefo women are not relegated to passive roles. Instead, they use their small, nimble frames to blend into the thick jungle foliage, acting as scouts and lookouts. Their stealth allows them to observe outsiders and potential threats from hidden vantage points, relaying important information back to the rest of the tribe. This practice of weaponizing their women has become a critical element in the tribe's ability to remain one step ahead of any outsider who might approach their territory. Because the Yaefo have remained so isolated, their way of life and cultural traditions are believed to have remained largely unchanged for centuries. They live off the land, hunting and gathering, while adhering to spiritual beliefs that guide their daily lives and practices. Rituals, ceremonies, and a deep connection to the jungle are at the core of their culture, though little is known about the specifics of these practices. The Yaefo, like many other tribes in Papua New Guinea, avoid interaction with the outside world, fiercely protecting their land and people from any form of external influence. Their desire for isolation has made them one of the most mysterious tribes in the world. Few outsiders have ever encountered the Yaefo directly, and those who do often leave with unsettling stories of their encounters. The tribe's commitment to preserving its traditions and protecting its territory has left the modern world with very little insight into their culture, and if they stick to their ways, it'll stay that way. But if you think you've seen the worst of it, think again. 3. Asmat Tribe In the remote swamps of Papua New Guinea, the Asmat Tribe has maintained traditions that many would find terrifying. Their homeland, a vast area of difficult-to-navigate terrain, is still largely unexplored because of the Asmat's fearsome reputation. The name Asmat is hotly debated. Some suggest it means man from tree, which some think is a nod to their dense forest environment, while neighboring tribes, like the Mimica, claim it more accurately translates to man-eater. Though outsiders may see them as menacing, the Asmat call themselves asmat Ao, meaning real people, and to them, the rest of the world just isn't as real as they are. The Asmat are divided into 12 groups, scattered across more than 100 villages in the swamps. This geographical isolation helped preserve their unique way of life for centuries. The Asmat's first significant contact with the outside world wasn't until the 1970s, when missionaries arrived and introduced metal tools like knives and axes. Before that, their weapons and tools were made from natural resources like wood, bone, and stone. Ironically, the introduction of these more effective tools made their headhunting practices even deadlier. Headhunting and cannibalism were central to Asmat culture for a long time, as part of both their warfare tactics and spiritual beliefs. In Asmat society, a warrior's reputation 
and sometimes even their very identity was tied to their ability to kill enemies. The act of taking an enemy's head was seen as a way to absorb that person's power and skills. The Asmat believed that the life force of the individual was stored in the head, so taking it was a way to strengthen oneself and the tribe. After a successful raid, the heads of enemies would be displayed as trophies in their homes, and in some cases, they were even used as pillows. For a child growing up in the Asmat tribe, earning a name wasn't easy. In fact, children remained nameless until they proved themselves by killing an enemy. This was seen as a rite of passage, signaling that the individual was now strong and brave enough to be recognized by the tribe. This brutal tradition reinforced the value the Asmat placed on strength, courage, and loyalty to the tribe. The Asmat's homes, often built near rivers, were strategically placed for quick and effective raids. The waterways provided easy access to neighboring tribes, allowing the Asmat warriors to launch surprise attacks and return with their gruesome trophies. Once back at the village, these heads were not only displayed but also sometimes worn. Parts of the body, like the lower jaw, would be fashioned into jewelry or ceremonial items, a constant reminder of how good they are at battle. While headhunting and warfare are the most sensational aspects of their culture, the Asmat are also known for their sophisticated art. Their wood carvings especially hold significant meaning in their society. Intricate sculptures, masks, and totem poles, known as bishji poles, are often created to honor the dead and engage with the spiritual world. These carvings, which represent ancestral spirits, are used in elaborate ceremonies that are dark, but they hold a lot of meaning to them. The Asmat believe that these rituals help maintain a connection with their ancestors, ensuring the continued protection and prosperity of the tribe and if anyone gets on their wrong side, they can turn them into art in no time. Four, but they're nothing in front of the Karubo. The Karubo tribe, also known as the Clubbers, live in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil, isolated from the modern world. Their territory lies along the Javari River in one of the most remote and inaccessible areas of the Amazon. The Karubo are one of the last remaining uncontacted tribes, known for their fierce defense of their land and traditional way of life. Their interactions with the outside world have been limited, but when they have them, they end up having violent clashes with outsiders, which has contributed to their reputation as a dangerous and mysterious tribe. The Karubo people are semi-nomadic, moving through the rainforest in small groups to hunt and gather. Their diet is mainly fish, wild fruits, and small animals like monkeys and birds. They use blowguns and spears to hunt, relying on their deep knowledge of the jungle to find food and navigate the dense forest. Unlike many other tribes in the region, the Karubo don't actually have permanent villages. Instead, they build temporary shelters as they move through the forest, using materials readily available around them like palm leaves and wood. But that's not what makes them different here. That's their use of clubs as weapons. These heavy wooden clubs are their main tool for hunting and self-defense, and they have used them in conflicts with both neighboring tribes and outsiders. The tribe's violent encounters with modern settlers and government forces have contributed to their reputation. Although these conflicts have largely stemmed from efforts to protect their land from encroachment. The Karubo have long had a tense relationship with the outside world. Many of their encounters with outsiders have led to bloodshed, as the tribe has historically rejected contact in order to preserve their way of life. The Brazilian government has had to step in to protect their territory, but at the same time, it's also meant that other people can be safe from them. But you can see them and their clubs coming at you what about the threats you can't see? Five, the Asaru tribe. The Asaru tribe might be one of the lesser known 
indigenous groups in the Amazon, but that just makes them even scarier. The tribe's isolation has preserved their traditional way of life, keeping them largely untouched by the modern world. Living in one of the most remote and dense areas of the jungle, the Asaru people rely on their surroundings for survival, mastering techniques passed down for generations to thrive in the wild. But their biggest strength is their deep spiritual connection to the land. Their beliefs revolve around the natural world, with the forest itself seen as a living entity filled with spirits. They believe that all life in the jungle, from the trees to the animals, is sacred, and they perform rituals to maintain harmony with these forces. These rituals are central to Asaru life, often led by spiritual leaders who use natural hallucinogens to communicate with the spirit world. Their ceremonies are believed to bring protection, health, and guidance for the tribe. The Asaru people are also known for their intricate body paint and tattoos, which hold spiritual significance. Each design tells a story or represents a particular aspect of their identity or role within the tribe. These markings are used in ceremonies and rituals to honor their ancestors or ask for blessings from the spirits of the forest. Both men and women participate in these traditions, with each individual contributing to the tribe's cultural heritage. The Asaru are often described as moving through the jungle like ghosts. Their deep knowledge of the rainforest allows them to navigate its dense, challenging landscape with near invisibility. They move silently, blending into their surroundings so well that outsiders rarely spot them, even when they're nearby. This ability to disappear into the wilderness has helped them avoid contact with the outside world, preserving their way of life for generations. Their presence in the jungle is almost undetectable, making them seem like spirits in their own land. By the time you think you've seen one of them, a dozen will surround you, and that might just be the last memory you ever make. While these tribes are scarier for the people who come in from the outside, some tribes are pretty terrifying for those living in them. 6. Like the Dani tribe The Dani tribe in the remote Balium Valley of Indonesia has traditions that might make you think twice about stepping into their world. They have long lived in isolation, and while the outside world may have tried to touch them, they've managed to keep hold of some brutal, ancient practices. The most chilling, their finger-cutting ritual. When a family member dies, especially a close one, the women of the tribe are expected to show their grief in a way that goes beyond tears. They cut off the top of their fingers. As a part of mourning, they take a sharp blade or a piece of string and amputate sections of their fingers, sometimes one, sometimes more, depending on the significance of the loss. It's not just a way to express pain. It's believed to sever the spiritual connection they had with the deceased. And the more fingers a woman has lost, the more loved ones she's had to mourn. Over time, a woman's hands can be the real representation of the number of people she's buried. But finger cutting isn't the only thing that makes the Danny tribe stand out. Historically, they were known for how brutal they are. Before the Indonesian government stepped in, intertribal conflicts were common. And these weren't just about land or resources. Sometimes revenge was the only motivation, leading to deadly raids and violent clashes between rival tribes. The Dani believed that eliminating an enemy could settle a score and bring peace to the spirits of the dead. After a fight, the losing side would suffer the brutal consequences of defeat, often with heads being taken as trophies. And let's not forget their funeral rituals. When someone dies, things aren't quiet. The village gathers for a massive pig feast, a ritualistic celebration of life and death, where the slain pigs are cooked in massive earthen ovens. These ceremonies are both a sign of respect for the dead and a way to mark major events like peace treaties, marriages, or the passing of a high-ranking tribe member. The larger the feast, 
the more honor is paid to the deceased. Some tribes, however, honor their deceased in other ways. 7. Like Sky Burials In Tibet, the practice of sky burials stands out as one of the most striking and somewhat unsettling rituals. Specifically, the Bern and Tibetan Buddhist communities engage in this ritual, which to them is a way for them to show respect for nature and the cycle of life. When someone dies, their family prepares the body for a sky burial by taking it to a remote mountaintop, often surrounded by breathtaking Himalayan vistas. But this isn't a traditional funeral. Instead of being buried or cremated, the body is left there on its own, exposed to the elements. This might seem shocking to outsiders, but for the burn practitioners, it's a sacred act. Vultures, which are abundant in the region, are believed to be divine creatures that help transport the deceased spirit to the afterlife. As the body lies on the rocky surface, the family actually watches as these scavengers descend, consuming the remains. This act symbolizes the ultimate return to nature, illustrating the belief that life and death are intertwined and that the body should nourish other living beings. For outsiders, this would be a barbaric thing for a family to even think about doing, but to them, it's a way for one's life ending to have real meaning by bringing life to those who are still on Earth. Other tribes aren't that generous. 8. Satare Mawe Tribe In the heart of the Amazon rainforest, the Satare Mawe Tribe carries out one of the most painful and terrifying rites of passage in the world the bullet ant initiation. The process begins with the creation of a pair of gloves, but these aren't ordinary gloves. They are woven from leaves and filled with bullet ants, which are famous for having one of the most painful stings of any insect on earth. The sting of a bullet ant is said to feel like being shot, hence its name and its effects can last for up to 24 hours. The pain is so intense that victims often describe it as waves of fiery agony. For the boys of the Satare Mawe tribe, this isn't a one-time ordeal. To complete the initiation, they have to wear the gloves, one on each hand, for a full 10 minutes, enduring the repeated stings of these aggressive ants. But the true test isn't just about surviving the pain. The boys have to stay as still and composed as possible, showing no sign of weakness or fear. This extreme resilience is seen as a measure of their readiness to join the ranks of the men in the tribe. The ritual doesn't end with just one round, though. To be considered a man, these boys have to go through the bullet ant initiation at least 20 times over the course of several months. Each time, they endure the excruciating pain, their hands swelling and their bodies trembling. In some cases, the venom can cause temporary paralysis, uncontrollable shaking, and hallucinations. While the sheer physical torment of the initiation is terrifying, it also holds deep cultural significance for the Satire Mawe people. The bullet ant ritual represents bravery, strength, and the ability to protect and contribute to the tribe. Only those who successfully complete the ceremony are considered true warriors capable of facing the dangers of the jungle and fulfilling their duties within the community. Without it, they're just boys. But these types of traditions aren't just for the boys. Some tribes are just as strict towards the women, but in different ways. Nine, like how the Mentawai women have to be. Deep in the jungles of Indonesia, the Mentawai tribe practices a terrifying and painful tradition that is as much about beauty as it is about status. Teeth chiseling. This brutal ritual, primarily performed on women, involves the painful process of filing their teeth into sharp points. For the Mentawai people, it's a rite of passage that transforms ordinary women into symbols of beauty, strength, and pride within their community. The process begins with a simple tool, a chisel and a hammer. A tribal elder, who is highly respected and experienced, has to be the one who performs the procedure. The woman sits still, 
while her teeth are filed down one by one into jagged, sharp points. There's no anesthesia or numbing agent to dull the pain. The excruciating procedure is done entirely without modern medical tools, relying only on the tribe's age-old methods. The Mentawai believe that a person's outer appearance should reflect their inner beauty. For women, sharpened teeth are seen as a way to enhance that beauty, making them more attractive and desirable within the tribe. But the teeth chiseling is also about status. Women who undergo the ritual are seen as strong, brave, and deeply committed to their culture. Despite the obvious pain, the Mentawai women willingly undergo this tradition as a badge of honor. They see it as a way to connect with their ancestors, as teeth chiseling has been practiced for generations. For the Mentawai, sharp teeth symbolize purity and beauty, and women who endure this practice are viewed as reaching a higher level of societal importance. The practice also has spiritual significance. The Mentawai believe that maintaining harmony between the body and spirit is essential to a good life. Altering the body, such as through teeth chiseling, helps achieve that balance. Women who take part in this painful ritual are not just beautifying themselves for the tribe, they are also aligning their spiritual and physical selves. And they're not the only ones. 10. The Padang The Padang, also known as the Kayan people, are famous for the unusual practice of neck elongation. This custom primarily involves women wearing heavy brass coils around their necks, starting at a very young age, sometimes as early as two years old. Over time, more coils are added, giving the appearance of a dramatically elongated neck. The interesting dark thing here is, the coils don't actually lengthen the neck. Instead, they push down the collarbone and compress the ribs, creating an illusion of elongation. Found mainly in Myanmar and some refugee camps in Thailand, these women wear the coils as a powerful symbol of both beauty and cultural identity. The longer and more prominent the neck, the more graceful the woman is perceived within the tribe. This practice has been passed down for generations, deeply embedded in their traditions. For the Kayan women, wearing the coils is not just about aesthetics, but also serves as a visible connection to their heritage and history. Even though they do it, they're physically deforming their bodies. How far would you go for tradition?